heaven's throne for us with eternity in mind to redeem the wounded soul to bring the way born of man he lived to die for his own Sacrifice our sin and shame, he washed away. Oh, the prize our Savior paid. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and all the earth sing his praise.
Hello friends and spiritual family. Welcome to our live stream service this weekend. And to our Covenanters, welcome home. If you're a visitor, we are so glad you took the time to join us and we believe God will meet you here in a personal way. So let's join our hearts now as we look to God in prayer together. Let's pray. And now we look to you, the God of heaven, our great and awesome God who keeps your covenant with those who love you and obey your commands. We are your people and your servants whom you have redeemed by your great power and strong hand. Thank you that your gracious hand has been upon us for good because of your covenant faithfulness. Therefore, as we gather, we ask, Lord, pour out your Spirit upon us. Open our eyes to see you high and lifted up our ears to hear the God who speaks and calls forth His remnant and stir our hearts, Lord, to arise and rebuild Your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we join Jennifer and her team now in worship, let's put away every distraction and give God the worship that is due Him. Good morning, church. What a joy and what a privilege it is for us to come together as a family of God this morning, as we worship Him, the God who deserves all the honour, the glory, and the power. And indeed, He alone is holy, holy, our God Almighty, who is and is and is to come. Still our hearts. Would you open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, so that we will see you, see you for who you are, Lord. Church, shall we all sing together? Holy, holy. Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
so that we can see you, Lord. Would you, Lord, help us, Lord, to see beyond our situations or circumstances, Lord. Help us, Lord, to remember that in our waiting, Lord, you're sanctifying us. And in situations where we can't understand, Lord, you're teaching us to trust strength within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears and you meet us in our morning with a love that casts out fear you are working in waiting you're sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the Turn it for our good. 
Thank you, Lord, for your perfect love. Cast out all fear. Oh, Lord, the love that you demonstrated on the cross as the lamb that was slain. Oh, Lord, yet, Lord, as the lamb that was slain, you were meek and humble. And yet, Lord, also, Lord, you are like a roaring lion. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the lion who roars from Zion. 
the Lord Almighty unstoppable, breaking every chain and fighting for us. One day, every knee shall bow before you. Yet you are the Lamb silent and slain for our sins, that our brokenness may be healed. Thank you, Lord, that you are always ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. King of heaven, come in. Expose every lie we've believed and tear down every stronghold. Convict every heart where sin resides and remains, that our hearts may return fully and arise ready for your work in our church and city. In Jesus' name we pray and we say, Amen. Amen. We have worshipped through our songs and prayers and now it's time to worship through our tithes and offerings. As Jesus has given Himself fully and freely to us, let us now give unto Him gratefully and cheerfully. Let us pray and give thanks for the tithes and offerings. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your life was given fully and lived fully for the purpose and destiny of God. So as we give now, let all our finances and energies and talents and time be given fully, that our lives lived fully for your destiny. Use and direct them as you will, that through these offered, your church will be rebuilt, renewed, revived for such a time as this and the city and the world may know and declare, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Have you been to our on-site services yet? We would love to see you at our on-site church on Sundays. There is nothing like gathering and worshipping together as God's people in person, as many have attested. Tickets do get taken up fast, so do book your seat today. And for parents with preschool and primary aged children, we still have our online TNG resources available to help you engage in discipleship activities and conversations with them. So do refer to the link at the bottom of the screen for more details. The theme and prophetic burden for this year is Discipling the Remnant. And bringing God's Word to us today from the book of Micah is our Senior Pastor, Rev. Tan Ke Kyung. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. By now, I trust you know that the spiritual burden for 2021 is discipling the remnant. Every year, we will seek God for His burden for covenant that will serve as an anchor as well as a springboard to fulfill our disciple-making mission. We have decided to take you through a survey of the theology of the remnant through some books of the Bible. Two weeks ago, Pastor Ed spoke about discipling the remnant through the book of Isaiah. Then last Sunday, Pastor Barney spoke about discipling the remnant through the book of Amos. If you had missed any of these sermons, you could still listen to them on our website sermon resource or in our Covenant app. Do you recall the three kinds of remnant that Pastor Ed highlighted in his sermon? Well, firstly, the historical remnant. This is about how God preserved the people of Israel in the Old Testament despite their captivity and exile. The second type are the future remnant. It is about how God will preserve a remnant in the second coming of Christ. Finally, the present remnant. Now, this is the call and application for the faithful spiritual remnant that lives in the here and now and how we need to ask God to renew and revitalize us from lukewarmness to a dynamic relationship with God. Today, I will take you through the book of Micah, which has seven chapters. In the New Year's sermon, the senior pastors have already preached from Micah chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. 
So today, I will take a much broader view and ski through the prophetic utterances of Prophet Michael that we might see the heart of God. But before I pray, let me share with you the overview of the book of Micah so that as we dive in later, you can make sense of it. And then later on in your personal reading, you can navigate better. There are altogether three prophetic oracles in the book and they follow a consistent pattern of the pronouncement of judgments, but always end with hope in God. Now, it will be easier to follow me if you use your hard copy Bible rather than your digital Bible. So pause the sermon if you need to. Go grab your Bible. Are you ready? First, Oracle 1. It's from Micah chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 13. From Micah chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, 11, you will read of Israel's impending judgment, 27 verses altogether. But it will end with two verses of hope and the restoration of the remnant of Israel in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Oracle 2, from Micah chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 15. From Micah chapter 3, verse 1 to 12, you will read again of God's indictment of the leaders and the house of Israel. But from chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, verse 15, 28 verses, you will read of the future exhortation and restoration of the remnant of Israel. Finally, the third oracle, from Micah chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, verse 20, you will read of God's lawsuits against Israel. From chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, uh, 6, 22 verses. But from 7, chapter 7, verse 7 to 20, 14 verses right now, you will again see the hope and the victory of the remnant of Israel. In summary, these are the three oracles in the book of Micah that alternates between judgment of God and the hope for the remnant. So pray with me right now. And let's ask God to show us His heart today. Dear Heavenly Father, open our eyes to see You for who You really are so that we might worship You not just in absolute awe and reverence, but also with pure love and gratitude. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The name Micah may be translated as a rhetorical question, who is like Yahweh? And the obvious answer is, there is absolutely no one like Yahweh. So as Micah moves around in town and boldly declares the prophetic oracles of God, no one can miss the message that is carried by his name and the words that he proclaims. It is no wonder how this book ended in Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of His inheritance? You see, the original listeners can't miss the central message Micah is trying to tell them. There is simply no God like Yahweh. This is the same heartbeat I'd like to bring to you today so that by the end of the message, you can also come to the same resounding conclusion there is simply no God like Yahweh. Let me show you the three portraits of God as shown in the book of Micah. Firstly, God is the righteous judge. Read the book of Micah and you can't miss the theme of God's righteous judgment. Like many prophetic books in the Old Testament, the portrait of an angry God can frighten us. Look at Micah 1 verse 2 to 5. Hear you peoples, all of you pay attention, O earth and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of His place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, 
like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Jump to Micah chapter 2 verse 3. Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I'm devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not walk haughtily for it will be a time of disaster. Go over to Micah chapter 3 verse 1 to 4 and I've chosen the message paraphrase. Then I said, listen, leaders of Jacob, leaders of Israel, don't you know anything of justice? Haters of good, lovers of evil. Isn't justice in your job description? But you skin my people alive. You rip the meat off their bones. You break up the bones, chop the meat and throw it in a pot for cannibal stew. The time's coming. Though when these same leaders will cry out for help to God, but He won't listen. He will turn His face the other way because of their history of evil. And finally, jumping to Micah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, reading from the New Living Translation. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against His people. He will bring charges against Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. Brothers and sisters, can you see the holy and righteous God in all these verses? Can you hear the cry of His righteous indictments? Oh, God does not close His eyes to our sins. Those verses in Michael 6 that we read, they are like lawsuits being read to an offender or lawbreaker. God will not close His eyes to our sins. He comes as a righteous judge and He laid all out on the table. God cannot close His eyes to our sins. For if He does, then He is no longer the fair and righteous God of the universe. He will no longer be our heavenly Father. Think about it. What earthly father wouldn't be angry if he sees his son stealing from others or beating up another kid? What earthly father wouldn't be angry if he sees his daughter getting drunk or hanging out with some bad company? Any earthly fathers will surely get angry and step up to discipline and correct his beloved children. So does God. We shouldn't be surprised with how God gets angry over our sins, get angry over how we treat others, gets angry over our worldly lusts and addictions that destroy our body and our marriage. Both Prophet Isaiah and Amos were contemporaries with Prophet Michael in the 8th century BC. God didn't send just one prophet to warn them, but a team of prophets in the various quarters and with various appeals. So the prophet Michael likewise catalogues specific sins of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. These sins included blatant idolatry, the seizure of other people's property, the failure of proper civil leadership, the corrupted religious leadership that goes after money, the prophetic leadership that says only what people want to hear, the belief that personal sacrifice satisfies divine justice, and corrupt business practices and violence. Yes, brothers and sisters, God does not, will not, and cannot close His eyes to our sins, for He is the righteous judge. In application, how do we as the present remnant of God respond to the righteous charges and judgments of God in the book of Micah? I believe first we stand guilty as charged. For the sins of Israel and Judah are very much present in us too. We ignore, disregard, and even deride God as irrelevant to us in the 21st century. We are capable of treating others 
who are different from us with disrespect, dishonor, and disdain. We are very capable of living double lives. Brothers and sisters, in recent times, great men of God have fallen. And surely we do not stand as judge over them, but we need to take heed lest we fall too. Brothers and sisters, one group of people that we must treat with greater honour and respect are the domestic helpers in our homes. For those, of course, we have domestic helpers. I know that there are challenges and issues with the attitudes and behaviour of some domestic helpers. And we can surely change the helper with the agency if the person is not a good fit. But their bad attitude or work output should not be the reason for us to treat them badly. We should also evaluate if we are part of the problem. We are accountable before God on how we view and treat them. I'm concerned that we are not treating them as helpers, but as slaves. And because our God is the righteous judge, we, the remnant, must uphold God's righteousness and do justice. I share this because someone in the congregation gave me a book to read last November. It's entitled, The Color of Compromise. It traces the 400 years of history in America and how they treated the blacks in the land. And the main thesis of that book is this, that the church and Christian leaders, they are guilty, guilty in their complicity to the problem of slavery in America. Throughout the centuries, the church was silent on that matter and even condoned the trait of slavery. Let me share you this example. From the church establishment of the European missionary, Francis Lajau, to South Carolina in 1717, these were the vows the African slave had to make in their baptism. Listen to these words closely. They are supposed to declare, you declare in the presence of God and before this congregation that you do not ask for holy baptism out of any design to free yourself from the duty and obedience you owe to your master while you live, but merely for the good of your soul and to partake of the grace and blessings promised to the members of the church of Jesus Christ. You see, in other words, they saw no contradiction between the brutalities of bondage and the good news of salvation. The church of God was guilty in not standing up for the slaves then. Today, if not careful, we can sabotage our faith by the way we treat the domestic helpers. So brothers and sisters, let's treat others kindly, fairly, and righteously. Because God is the righteous judge and the remnant of God must do justice. The second portrait I'd like to show you is the God is our shepherd king. As a result of Israel's failure to uphold the righteousness of God, God had to judge them. But in His judgment, God is merciful to preserve a remnant. The first oracle of Micah begins in chapter 1, verse 2, that shows God as the righteous judge. But it ends with words of hope and restoration. It shows us that the next portrait of God as the shepherd king. Look at Micah chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. I will surely examine all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a foal, like a flock in his pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the bridge goes before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Here God is portrayed as a shepherd who will gather the remnant of Israel into the foal and pasture where there is security and shelter. Verse 13 further tells us that God is not just a shepherd, but a king who will break through the gates and go ahead of the flock. A picture of the shepherd king who guides and leads us forward right at their head. This shepherd king metaphor is repeated in chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. 
In that day, declares the Lord, I will examine the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. This is the prophetic utterance of the return of the people from their future exile. Verse 6 to 7, Michael describes them as lame, meaning they were weak because of their affliction. But despite of their weakness, verse 7 tells us God will transform the lame into the remnant. This is an important emphasis here as the returning people do not automatically become a remnant. They had to be made into a remnant. It's a Hebrew idiom. As a result, you can see their calling and destiny in the Lord in Micah chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man nor wait for the children of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion amongst the beasts of the forest, like a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep which when he goes through, treads down and tears in pieces and there is none to deliver. I won't say anything more about these verses as we have already preached on it on the first Sunday of the new year. But just to remind you, God can make the spiritually lame into his refreshing dew and roaring lion among the nations. That's also our calling and destiny in God as believers and as the church. In application, brothers and sisters, this is an important point for the remnant of God. We need to be made. Christian maturity and development need to be made. It is not automatic because God is the shepherd king who looks out for the lame and afflicted. We too must do likewise. We must love kindness and mercy. Last week, I met a couple at the pastor's prayer summit and heard this inspiring story. This brother works as a housing agent and several years ago, helped a single mom and her daughter to rent a room. Recently, he heard she was stricken with late-stage cancer and offered to help her in anything. In the process, he heard that her 10-year-old daughter would be adopted by another family. Not long after, my friend received the request for him to adopt her daughter. He was shocked by the request. He was not prepared for this. After all, he had three young children of his own. But after praying with his wife and processing with their children, they agreed that if God wills so, they will be willing. Now here comes the part of the story that touched me tremendously. They process this with their primary school going children and ask what they think. They all thought about it and said, well, our family motto is to show God's love. Love one another. So they all agreed to it. And all of a sudden, the reality hits home. One of the older boys said, that means two of us, we have to sleep in the living room so that the newly adopted daughter can sleep in their room. They process this a little bit more. And both boys amazingly said, yes, we will go to the living room. I was flawed by that part of the story. But how many of our children will be willing to give up their comfortable space and room for a stranger? They were truly well taught and grounded in their family motto to love others. To wrap up the story, eventually the adoption did not come to pass as the single mom managed to find a relative to adopt her, but requested this family to bring her daughter to church every Sunday. Sadly, the mother passed on last week. I share this story with you because this family followed in the footsteps of the wonderful Shepherd King. How they reach out to the weak and the lame in the society 
and was willing to embrace this young girl into their fold, despite of the possible many inconveniences and challenges. They allow God to use them and make them into a spiritual remnant to love kindness and to exercise mercy. What an inspiring testimony. Today, God is seeking out His spiritual remnants to shepherd and love the flock. Will you be God's under-shepherd and guide to others as well? Yes, our God is the righteous judge. He is also the shepherd king. And finally, for the last sermon point today, God is the compassionate forgiver. We come to the last segment of the book of Micah, where chapter 6 began with the Lord's lawsuits against His people. He recounts their journey from the deliverance of Egypt to the promised land. How God extended His grace and love to His people over and over again, despite their rebellious grumbling. The third oracle continues in chapter 7 and describes the misery and the spiritual apathy of the people. But then the focus began to shift from chapter 7, 7 onwards. That Israel will watch in hope for the Lord. Israel will wait for God to save them. For they will rise again as God's mighty instrument in the world. And then the book of Michael ended with these final words about God in relation to the remnant. Micah chapter 7, verse 18 to 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of His inheritance? He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. The remnant of God can be hopeful and optimistic even in their darkest time. But this is not because of their strengths or abilities or their positive outlook, no. It's primarily because of the steadfast and compassionate forgiving nature of God that while God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness to the thousand generation. This is the great promise of God to Abraham and to Israel. The believing remnant of Israel could know that an end will come to their humiliation and judgment. And therefore, when Jesus died on Calvary, that same promise of His eternal blessings for the people of God extends to us now. His blood cleanses us from all our sins and breaks all our bondages. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God is eternally our compassionate forgiver for all time and eternity. Hallelujah. Sometime back, I saw an episode in the Korean reality show, Master in the House. This reality show will feature a prominent master in Korea from various fields and professions. Five cast members will spend two days one night with the master to learn from him or her. So in this particular episode, this master was asked how he raised his children to be loving and respectful to others. And he told this story that touched me. He said one day he was at his second story room overlooking the street when he saw to his horror one of his sons push another child off the bicycle. He was shocked, heartbroken. At this point, I thought that he would go on to say how he went on to discipline his son and etc. But instead, this is what he did. He went down to the street immediately, helped the boy who was bleeding from the fall. He didn't say a single word to his own sons. He brought this injured boy to the parents who were just living down the street. And of course, he brought his sons along too. Then what happened? 
touch me. The father handed the injured child over to the parents and then knelt, knelt down before the parent. And he said these words, I am the father of these two sons who pushed your son off the bicycle. I'm terribly sorry your son is injured. I am fully responsible for it. I did not raise my sons properly to treat others with respect. And with tears in his eyes, he said, please forgive me. His neighbour was totally shocked by what he did. His two sons behind him were crying by now. And then he went home with his two sons without saying a single word to them. From that day onwards, he reported how his sons were impacted and transformed by this incident. He never had to teach them to respect and love others again. What a touching story, isn't it? I share this story to illustrate this is what our Heavenly Father did for us when we sinned against Him, when we went astray from Him. He paid the penalty for our sins by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Jesus took on our sins upon Himself. And now whosoever believes in Him shall not perish in their sins. They will be forgiven and they will receive the free gift of eternal life. If you have not yet received this free gift of eternal life today, you can do so today. Just pray sincerely in your heart like this. From wherever you are, say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Thank you for cleansing me from all unrighteousness. I receive you into my heart today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have prayed this prayer, doesn't matter where you are, please scan this QR code right now so that we can keep in touch with you. For the rest of us who are believers, I know that while the penalty of sin has been removed, the effects of our sin nature continues to battle in our flesh. And so we are caught in some habitual sins and we don't seem to be able to break free from it. Then I urge you in this new year to confess it to someone and seek for some accountability in your life. It is difficult to fight sin alone by yourself. You can do it better. Of course, with God's help, but in a community, we can take comfort and strength that our God is the compassionate forgiver of all our sins. And therefore, we learn to walk humbly before Him. Let me conclude the sermon for today. I've sought to show you the three portraits of God in the book of Michael. That our God is the righteous judge, the shepherd king, and the compassionate forgiver. Because God is the righteous judge, the remnant must do justice. Because God is the shepherd king, the remnant must love kindness. And finally, because God is our compassionate forgiver, the remnant must walk humbly before Him. In doing so, our eyes are open to who our God really is. He is not some domestic local God whom we can command and control as we like. But our God is the universal righteous judge, the sovereign shepherd king, and the eternal compassionate forgiver that we must worship in absolute awe and reverence, in pure love and gratitude. And then should anyone ask, who is, like, who is this Yahweh? Then we can cry it out with a loud resounding voice, there is absolutely no one like Jehovah God. And there is only one worthy response for the remnant of God to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray together. In a moment's time, we will sing this beautiful hymn. It goes something like this, There is an everlasting kindness you lavished on us. When the radiance of heaven came to rescue the lost, you caught the sheep without a shepherd to leave their distress for your streams are forgiveness and the shade of your rest 
and with compassion for the hurting, you reach out your hand as the lame ran to meet you and the dead breathed again. You saw behind the eyes of sorrow and shed in our tears, heard the sigh of the weary. Oh, let the children draw near. As you continue that posture of worship, let this wonderful hymn minister to your soul. There is an everlasting kindness you lavished on us when the radiance of heaven came to rescue the lost. You call the sheep without a shepherd to lead their distress for your streams of forgiveness and the shade of Two reflection questions that you can share with the family or in the, in the covenant group. The first question, share a moment in your life where you could exclaim, wow, there is no God like Yahweh. Secondly, is there a specific leading this morning for you to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Would you bow your heads and receive God's benediction? Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of His inheritance? You do not stay angry forever but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins, our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You'll be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledge on and on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Oh Lord, we thank you this day that this is totally fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. So people of God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you.